sorry, mama. What was my favorite episode of being some butthead? <laughs> Have y'all been recording this whole time? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a good job. This is Carlos with Closers Coffee. I'm here with Austin Rowling, the CEO and co-founder of Outfield. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Austin. I'm glad to be here. Awesome, man. I know uh, we've uh, we've been planning this for a while, so I'm glad to actually have you here. Yeah, I'm glad uh, that you came down here, man. Yeah, man. Feels good <laughs> to be in Houston. To the H. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been good, man. Yeah. Uh, Houston has definitely shown me the hospitality, so. You need to come back. Uh, it's a lot of fun down here, man. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll kind of start off with, tell me a little bit about the, uh, the evolution of Outfield and, and your vision. Uh, Outfield, um, it, it, it started in Bryan College Station. Okay. Um, it started um, with myself and one other gentleman who's my co-founder. His name is Adam Steele. Uh, we had worked together on a project um, prior to, actually a couple of projects together. Um, and so we had a chance to sit down and talk one day and just hit it off, right? We naturally, there was um, um, some likability there. There was, uh, you know, similar characteristics in terms of ambitions and, and goals and, and we just hit it off, right? And so we ended up finding, I was uh, with one of my classes, I ended up finding Servesh who was, uh, and you know he was uh, he was an MIS student at the time, he, and I basically was like, "Hey man, you uh, we're trying to start this organization up. Are you down?" He was like, "All right, sure." He didn't know what we were doing. Nobody knew Sign what we up. were doing. Sign me up. So, anyways, we got together and we started working on um, an application. It was, it was we coined it Mentor Match, which was basically an app that was uh, designed to uh, connect entrepreneurs with uh, experts within any given field, right? It was just a platform for, for connecting people. And uh, we, we raised a little bit of seed capital um, in order to get that project off the ground. And, um, you know, we, we worked on it for a couple of months and it flopped, right? <laughs> it completely flopped. And, uh, but, you know, the good news is, is throughout that process, we learned a lot. We learned a lot about how to work with one another. Uh, we, we learned a lot about um, our strengths, our weaknesses, and how we could combine and leverage each other's capabilities in, in order to um, to work together and, and do something positive. So uh, we we took a break, a couple of months. Uh, we took a couple of months break, and then uh, the, the guys who uh, invested in, in in our application uh, they ran uh, a nutraceutical and suppl supplement company in in College Station. Uh, called Cellucor. Okay. Right. You know they make the protein powders and the pre workouts and all of that stuff that you'll find in in uh, vitamin shop, GNC, uh, places like this. And so I went um, and met with Manish Patel um, at the time he was a president, and uh, I said, Hey man, you know um, our last project didn't work. Um, are you interested in doing anything else? Um, we're, you know we 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 got a clean slate. So you know what's you know what's available. And he said, you know what? Okay. Uh, he said, hey, you know, we, we got this project that we put on the shelf. Um, and, uh, we, we, you know, this is something potentially that you guys could focus on. And it was an application called Outfield, right? It was something that they were using to manage uh, their outside sales team, right? They had all of these reps that will go into a vitamin shop at GNC and essentially um, work with the in-store representatives to uh, pretty much promote their brand of products, right? Driving had, brand affinity. Yeah, getting all of people that. All of that informed, stuff. Informed. Right? Mm -hmm, got mm -hmm, it. Train them up and all of that stuff, right? And uh, they had no way of really tracking the whereabouts, what they were doing. The, they needed a way to centralize all the reports and the call forms and things like that they were filling out. And the problem was is that there's no Android app available at this point, and the web-based version is lacking, and the iOS uh, app is buggy. Right, so we know what we're working with. So um, the money that we were making from our sales, um, literally we 
Adam wasn't on payroll. I wasn't on payroll either. So we basically said, all right, this money that we're bringing in, let's just go hire some some more developers who can fix these apps, right? We, you know, we went in, we went ahead and, and hired some iOS uh, developers. We went ahead and hired some um, Android developers, and we went to work. And so then at that point, I was the only customer facing person on the team. Gotcha. And so we went ahead and uh, we, we we sourced Pearl, who uh, was essentially uh, the Robin to my Batman. Right. And so we would work on generating um, uh, customer acquisitions together. And so the first couple of years of Outfield was primarily focused on building an awesome product. Right. So we did very little advertising, very little marketing, um, very little brand awareness. No one knew about us for the most part. We just wanted to focus on putting together a dope product. Once we got comfortable um, in, 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 in our product to the extent to where we were like, okay, uh, our product is, is dope now. Uh, we had picked up some signature accounts um, at that point and we had enough revenue uh, at that point to go ahead and, and, and start hiring uh, people who can work on our sales and marketing side. So at that point, um, you know, we started working out of the Canon, which is a, is a co-working space um, here in Houston. And uh, myself and Pearl, we started working out of this co-working space. And then we, we went on to, to, to hire more sales and marketing people. So we went ahead and we hired Lane, we hired Rory, we hired uh, Christian, and we started expanding um, on the sales and marketing side. So right now we're, we're really at that point to where our product is dope. Let's hire some sales and marketing people. Let's start telling the world who we are. And so that's pretty much been like the initial um, evolution, kind of like summarized up in, in a very quick sort of tale. Um, but we went from product focus to shifting our attention towards uh, brand awareness and advertising and marketing. And that's really where we are now um, as a company. Let's uh, tell me a little bit about yourself um, and kind of your background. So um, I don't know where to start. Basically, I grew up son of a, of a, of a preacher slash entrepreneur, um, grew up the son of a, of a, a preacher's daughter um, on the other side. OK. Uh, family of eight, um, the youngest of, of eight. Um, Big family. Huge family, huge family. And, and, uh, you know, it's just one of those things when you're the youngest, you got to you got to fight in order. It's almost like you got to fight in order to eat because it's, see, you're competing with so many other voices <laughs> in order to get attention. So, yeah, you, you, you definitely got to be vocal, uh, the youngest of eight. And, and so it's, it's really interesting dynamic. Everyone, for the most part in my family, um, different, different personalities, but the same. I like to consider myself as pretty much uh, the, the, the combination of all of my brothers and sisters into one body. I, I literally have taken a piece of what's special about each one of them and internalized it into myself. And um, my dad, he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he started up his uh, a real estate investment, a property investment uh, company in the 80s. Um, and it did very well. Um, and so just kind of sitting back and and uh, seeing uh, and witnessing as, as a kid, uh, the amount of um, effort and energy that was required in, 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 in what he was, uh, was doing. Um, I got a chance to see the results from the fruit of his labor. Um, very, very hard worker, very, very um, deliberate in his approach. Um, and I took a lot of that and, and I internalized that. My, my father just kind of give, give a little bit of background about him and he doesn't really talk about this so much, but my father didn't graduate from high school, right? He didn't graduate from high school. He grew up, um, you know, with a single, you know, in a single uh, uh, household with, with, with my grandmother. He was the uh, stereotypical black kid, right? And, you know, father was gone for the most part. And he had every excuse to pretty much become a failure, right? And uh, he didn't. He 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 just, you know what I mean? He he just weathered the storm, um, and he just took this no excuses sort of mindset and said, "I'm going to be successful, despite of all the obstacles and and, and you know all the obstacles out that I was confronted with or the hand that I was dealt." And so when you grow up with a father like that, it's just like no excuses. Like he had every 
reason. He was a statistic, right? Grew up in yeah. the ghetto, had every, you know, did drugs and all of that stuff, right? Um, he had every uh, excuse to become a, a statistic, but he didn't. And so as a kid, seeing that, witnessing the amount of hard work and, and um, the, the, the just amount of attention that he gave us and, and the amount of love that he gave us, um, it, it just it just resonated, I think, with all of us. And it, and it showed us that if you really go out, um, no matter what circumstances you dealt, uh, you can be successful. And so that was, that's, that's where the burning uh, desire for just not entrepreneurship, because I saw that, you know, a guy with no high school diploma was able to, 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 to raise um, a, a, a huge household, yes. right? And um, he was successful, right? And I saw the merits of entrepreneurship and I said, hey, this is real. This is real. And so I want to be an entrepreneur. From an early age, you, from an, you identified from, with it. I, I identified with it. It didn't really mature until I got older. Mm -hmm. and, and I went to college and I really saw what my father was really doing and what he was trying to instill in us. When I was a kid, you know, he made us mow the lawn. He made us rake the leaves. He made us do all of this stuff that we did not want to do. And when you're a kid, you just don't understand um, the level of discipline that he was trying to instill in you, right? And, and the work uh, ethic that he was trying to instill in you. But once you get older and you start seeing the real world for what it is, you start to admire those characteristics and you start to understand what it was that he was trying to do with us. And and uh, that, that, that resonated with me. And I, I do want to make a special point to talk about my mother along the way, because I don't think she gets enough credit for being um, the the, uh, the beautiful um, and, 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 and powerful woman that she was having to raise. She was a stay at home mom. Wow. Right. And she raised us all um, while he was out doing his thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's Sometimes, you know, w women don't get enough credit uh, for the success of their man. Very true. Right? And uh, my father would have never been who he was if it wasn't for her. She created um, a sense of stability around the household that made him comfortable and confident enough to actually go out and take risks. Right? And if, if, uh, she, was, um, if she was unstable, if she wasn't, a, if she was, uh, you know, just, I don't know, if she just was unstable, that would not have allowed him the, the flexibility in, in, in the room to go out and, and take some of these risks. She motivated him to go out and do these things. So that's really- the, He needed the, that backbone. He needed that backbone. Yes. And he got it. And, and that's the power of, if you can, if you can get, a, get the right woman uh, by your side, you know what I mean? You could conquer. You can conquer the world because when when my dad met my mom, he was still out hustling. You know what I mean? He's still out drinking. You know what I mean? And my mom was just like, "Hey man, uh, if you want to be with me, you got to clean up your act." And he did. He cleaned up his act. He started working and and uh, doing some of the right things. And he started up his own company. And and uh, he did it. And 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 here we are. So I, I grew up with the mother that made you believe that you can do it. Uh, I grew up with a father that showed you how to do it. My, my dad, for for the first, like, I don't know, X amount of years, probably first decade that he was getting his company off the ground, he was working He was working another job. He was working for Whirlpool at the time. So he was working for Whirlpool, and then he had a side hustle. His side hustle turned into his real hustle, and then it became successful. So he had a vision. He just... He had a vision. He had a vision. He saw things that uh, not everybody saw, especially coming from an area to where we came from. It wasn't a lot of African-Americans that were um, really taking those sorts of risks. And so he didn't really see a lot of people that looked like him that were doing those, those sorts of things. And so not only was he a visionary, but he had the hustle and, and he had the, uh, the, the grit in order to, to, to overcome some, you know, some of those obstacles that were confronted with him. You know, he didn't have a diploma. He didn't have a lot of different, he didn't have a college degree. He didn't have a lot of different things and yet he made it. Very successful guy. And so, you know, he's, 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 he's just pops. Yeah, yeah that's pops. awesome. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you're the youngest of eight. Yeah. And so from, uh, you know, uh, having eight, seven siblings yeah. competing against them for <laughs> your parents' time, uh, yeah. resources yeah. and love. Yeah. How was that growing up? Man. Let me tell you, man. I and, and we and 
I think out of all of us, my, my sister might be the favorite. Uh, my <laughs> sister Alexis might be the favorite. Now, does she say that? Uh, she thinks I'm the favorite. Okay. I think she's a favorite, which I think is is boy. I, I, I got I got my butt whooped the most out of I think out of everyone in my family, right? I was a little adventurous as a kid. Okay. I was a little adventurous. I took took some risks and I probably did some things I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but man, I, I took some of the some of the rawest beat downs in front of friends, in front of family members, I think, out of anybody else in the family. Um but it was cool, man. It was it was protected. I was protected as a kid. I always knew that I was loved. And, and, and a lot of times when um, you grow up as a kid, you need to know that you got that foundation and, and that, um, you got that you got that love there. And so by me being the youngest, I was able to learn um, from everything that everyone who came before me, what they did right and what they did wrong. And I was able to internalize that. And likewise, they were coaching me, hey, I did this wrong. This is how you do it. And so, at you know, being the youngest of eight, you got, you want to be a listener. You want to you want to internalize the things that um, um, that they're telling you. That way, uh, you can kind of uh, circumvent some of the mistakes uh, that they made and, and and try to make your life easier. So, Austin, tell me, um, uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up. Uh, well, the first part of my life, I grew up in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Okay, um, which. Uh, it's predominantly black. Uh, and then when I was in third grade, uh, my family, we moved to uh, Stevensville, which was predominantly white. And so it was, it was totally changed in, in dynamics, right? So um, you totally different situation, totally different uh, way of growing up. But I think it was one of the, the best things that ever happened to me as a kid. And what were some uh, of the uh most memorable childhood memories that you had from uh, growing up and living uh, in, in Stevensville? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or, or just overall in general? It, yeah, in Stevensville in general. Uh, man, I was an adventurous kid, man. Just playing, playing um, uh, basketball. Okay. I mean, people would come over from the neighborhood all the time and we would play ball. I used to hoop a lot, uh, ride bikes as a, as a third grader ride all throughout the city, man. Uh, getting into stuff I probably shouldn't have get it, gotten into. Uh, very adventurous. Um, I, I really I really liked uh, the, um, the growth that came from uh, the, the transition from predominantly one race to another because that, that helped, uh, that enabled me to uh, uh, feel more comfortable in, in environments where everyone didn't look like me sure. and I was able to establish relationships that way and uh, I thought that was a genius move by my parents because that's the real world you, you you need to be able to engage interact and to develop relationships with people of all races you know all demographics and so putting me completely outside of my comfort zone with people that was totally different uh, upbringing um, it 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 helped open my eyes and it helped me develop uh, a sense of confidence that, hey, I can get along with anybody. And, and I think um, that's when you when you're dealing with people, that's one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest setbacks. And I think of in civilization is not everyone is, is comfortable uh, interacting with people outside of their their bubble yes. or their world. That exposure and helps. That exposure helps. It gets you comfortable, and and then um, you're once you start in, interacting with people, you start to see that hey, they're human just like me. You know what I mean? They yes. may look like they may not look like me. Um, they may not have the same nose as me, but they're human, right? And uh, you can you can um, just foster genuine relationships that way. Yeah. Awesome. And so you mentioned uh, that you uh, you you completed your MBA at sure. Texas A and M. Um, what was post-college, post-MBA life uh, for you? Wow. Post-MBA, very, very dark. Very, very dark. It was one of the darkest uh, times of my life. Um, that's, when I was, that's when I was going through this phase of, of trying to uh, start up a company. And coming out of MBA school, you're broke. You have no money at all, no savings. Uh, so I had no idea what I was going to do. 
I came out of MBA school. That's when I was working with, um, you know, my team and we were trying to just develop startup projects and, and, and trying to be, um, trying to just create something, yeah. right? Innovate. Innovate, really just... yeah, but you're broke. And I had a lot of things to the, to, to, to the peripheral that were going on that was uh, kind of uh, uh, slipping out of control. And so when you're not, when you're not in, a, in a stable situation that can impact you in, in, in a number of different ways from a health perspective, a mental health perspective, I remember uh, trying to, you know, when I was uh, trying to get outfield uh, off the ground, I was literally homeless. Wow. I had no place to live. I uh, uh, my my house went up for foreclosure because I couldn't uh, I couldn't afford to keep it up, uh, and I lost my car. I, I lost my car. It, it got it got repossessed. So all of this is happening. You lose your house. Uh, you lose your car. You're literally homeless, and you're trying to start a company up. So you t- want to talk yes. about stress tests? Yes. You want to talk about endurance and, and, and toughness and metal. Um, that's as, as tough as it gets. And, and, and I don't usually share that with a lot of people. This is actually, in fact, the first time I publicly, publicly came out and, and uh, you know, talked about that. Um, and my team doesn't even know that, right? But um, post NBA, like, I remember um, I was couch surfing, uh, floor surfing. Wow. Just, just trying to, uh, just trying to figure out how I'm gonna make this thing happen. With a vision. With the, all I knew was I had a vision. With a vision. All I knew was I, all I knew was, is this has got to happen. And um, you know, at that moment in time when you literally, you have nothing, your family starts to look at you. You know, people start to look at you like, hey man, what's going on, man? You just got this MBA. You know, why, why are you going through it like this? And you're just trying to it's hard to articulate what's going on in, in your heart and what's going on in your, in your mind um, and your, your true north to people when all they see is your circumstances and, and yes. what's going on um, around you. And uh, it was tough. Uh, and so eventually, eventually, you know, it got better. But coming out of MBA school, I went jobless for a long time. Um, the first job that I got out of uh, MBA school, I worked for Sports Authority. Okay. It's making $12 an hour. Out of this, MBA school? Out of MBA school, making $12 an hour. This is after I lost my house. This is after I lost my car. Uh, I was living with my cousin who, at that point, she was my rock. That's all I had was my cousin. And, and then I stayed uh, on my boy's couch for a couple of months. And it was in terms of like, uh, confidence and self-esteem was the lowest point I've ever been in my entire life because you literally lost everything. You hit ground zero. And you're coming out of MBA school, you're seeing your colleagues, right? You're yes. seeing everybody that you went to school with and they're going on in their career. Everybody's telling a different story. They're telling a completely different story. Everyone was coming out with their six-figure jobs, making 150, 120, 130, working for these big companies and all this other stuff. And here I am working at Sports Authority for $12 an hour. And people like, I'm literally taking orders for somebody, you know. <laughs> so, yes, so, grabbing sneakers out the back. Yeah, man, grabbing sneakers, you know, uh, uh, cleaning, wiping down shelves. And it was the most humbling, sort of embarrassing, sort of, it was just a rough moment. Uh, and, you know, uh, just, just going through that phase, man, uh, you know, it's just, it's just really dark and you don't know how uh, you're going to get out of it. You see no light at the end of the tunnel, but you just got this vision. I, I just know in order to kind of cope with that, because that's one of the things you had, how to ask, how did I deal with it is it was, it was really, man, a lot of just, um, just soul searching. You're really in your head a whole lot, just trying to figure out how can I navigate through the situation. It's a whole lot of being patient uh, because you know something's going to pop. You just don't know when. It's just really yeah. dark, man. It Like in order to kind of, uh, I, I used to, it was like it was a form of therapy for me to just go in and just lay in my room on the floor, on the floor and just listen to, I used to listen to Christian music. Um, I, there was this one particular uh, song that it really got me through those moments. It was called uh, Oceans uh, by Hill, Hill Song, United. 
from the and, Hill song. Yeah, and the 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 uh, the premise of the song was um, just stepping out on faith, right? It was just really about um, stepping out on water, right? And you don't know you're supposed to be walking on this water, right? Yeah, uh, and you don't know like how you're going to be walking on this water, right? You just know that uh, in the song is, is, is God telling you to step out and just walk in this water, come to me. But all you see is the water, right? And like, how am I going to walk over this water? But it's really just about the application of faith. You know what I'm saying? And, and everything is looking bleak. It looks, it looks like it's not going to work. And so um, in the song, it's just all about just, just being in that moment, stepping out on faith, believing that something's going to happen, um, even when you don't see it. Um, and literally, man, I used to just sit in my room and, and, and just do that for months. Then I would go in and go to work, wipe off shelves and literally with my sports authority shirt, I'm like, man, I got to take a half an hour lunch today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was, yeah. bar I was borrowing my cousin's car. I remember my, uh, I remember Adam asked me one time and he, he still, he doesn't know the story to, to, to this day. But uh, I remember I drove to College Station because I had to go meet with Adam and uh, some other people at, 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 uh, at our headquarters back then. And he's like, hey, man, did you get a new car? <laughs> <laughs> he had no idea what I was going through at all. I was like, sure. no, nah, man, yeah, 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 I got a new car. This is my car, right? It was a Yaris. Yeah. <laughs> totally did not fit my swag at all. He's like, hey, man, you get a new car? And I said, like, yeah, man, I got a new car. I never, he had no idea all that stuff was going on. No idea whatsoever. Because you're a very private person in terms of, you yeah, know. Yeah, a private person, um, private person. But one of the, because we had uh, people on our team at that point. And um, one of the things uh, as, as a leader of a team, you got to show strength even when you're going through some, some stuff. Right. Because they a lot of times your team, they, they, they'll take their cues off of you. So if I go in there with a certain, you know, you know, you're wearing it, if I'm wearing it right, then then they they they, they take clues from that. And so you got to show like this sort of presentation that everyone's comfortable with. So I, I did not want my team to sense any instability there. So I really had to internalize all of that stuff I was going through. And then it had to go out the window whenever I was interacting with my team. And so during this time, what were some of the things that you would do to stay um, kind of those uh, mentally, uh, mental exercises to really just understand that this is temporary? Yeah. This is, uh, this is just the moment as it is today. Man, I'm telling you, you gotta be real creative when you're broke. The house broke for long. You got to be creative. It ain't like you could just go to the movies and nothing like that. Um, literally, I would just lay on the floor. And, like, I had no bed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm laying on the floor. I, I was literally living in, in my cousin's crib, and I had a pallet. You know what I mean? So I was just literally just chill on the floor and just listen to music uh, and listen to really inspirational, uplifting music. It was really um, a matter of just keeping my spirits up. Uh, knowing that something good was on the horizon and um, working out. That's all I had. Yeah. Go to the gym. I was going to the yes. gym like eight times a week. Let me, <laughs> I got to do something. You got to get out of the house. You don't want to be in the house with the cats all day because they had cats. And I'm like, I don't like cats, man. I don't, what are you doing with these cats, right? Uh, one, one was cool, though. One, the crush was cool. The other one was a, was a, was a mess, but the but, but crush was cool. Anyways. Um, just working out, man, and I read a lot. Um, I read a lot, and I just tried to listen to uh, as much um, uh, uplifting um, media as I possibly could. And I did that for months, and I was eating tuna out of a can. I was, I was it was rough, man. And so when, uh, you know, you talk about the process and this journey that you had in, in that dark moment. When did you notice that the uh, momentum and the pendulum was swinging uh, in the opposite direction? Uh, <laughs> when did it start uh, swinging? All right, well, all right. So I ended up uh, getting a job with Beats, right? And... Um, I remember I interviewed for 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 Beats, and I'm just like, man, what's happening here? Uh, and 
it turned out to be a perfect opportunity. That's where we had it. That's where we met is, 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 is uh, um, at the Beats program. But that essentially uh, was the, the moment where I got tossed um, like a lifeline, right? And I was, I was able to start bouncing back a little bit more. And so the confidence started to come back. Um, the stability started to come back and then I was able to get back on my feet and I was able to get in my own apartment. I was able to do all these different things and I was able to get a uh, promotion with the company. And then, you know, um, think, you know, that led to um, all sorts of other opportunities. But while I was working at Beats, as you know, I was I was working on outfield at the same time, and and it was it provided a whole lot of value not just for myself but for the company because I wasn't a drain on the payroll. I didn't need to be on the payroll because, you know, I had income coming in from 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 the company, and so all the money that was coming in from from uh, from outfield we reinvested back into the company. So once you know that started to occur, um, that's when the initial um, um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel started to show. Yeah. And then later on, um, you just start seeing us close, you know, bigger deals, bigger opportunities. Um, and like the company became self-sustainable. Like I was able to leave uh, working for Beats, right? And focus on the company full time. So the model has been build a great product, build the infrastructure yeah and and now it's evolving into this more uh, eccentric brand that's yeah. really starting to, yeah. to identify with verticals and customer base yeah um so let's talk about the team you know okay. you've, you've mentioned uh you uh you and adam uh kind of built a foundation from there you've, yeah you've you've kind of um worked on the product uh now that you've really built a product you've evolved into uh, growing your sales and marketing organization sure. um, tell us about uh, what you look for in uh um in, in a team member yeah. when, you, when you're hiring and yeah. uh tell us kind of how the team has evolved over these years uh the the, the team is, is is taking on a culture um of its own and uh a lot of our, our team they love working for outfield i love working for outfield and uh, that's it's been relatively and in some instances surprisingly easy uh, to recruit top talent. Everyone on my team, I'm, I'm proud to have them working with us, and and they they work hard, right? They work hard. Um, they we have fun. Uh, we have an appreciation for what it is that we do. But while we're having fun and while we're having um, um, an appreciation for what we're do what we're doing, we also hold each other accountable um, in a very real way. All of us have are aligned in terms of where we're going. All of us are aligned in terms of the vision of the company. We all work hard. We all um, make certain sacrifices that uh, we probably wouldn't necessarily make if we were working for a different um, company, right? And so that's one of the biggest things that I have an appreciation for is people, we make sacrifices uh, for the company. We make sacrifices for our colleagues. Uh, you know, when you're working with a small team, that matters. In terms of the culture itself, um, tried to put a place, um, Adam and myself, we tried to put it uh, in place a culture where people are comfortable uh, with experimentation, trying new things, being innovative, being creative. Part of that is, is creating a climate where people aren't um, afraid to fail, right? I've worked in a number of different environments where um, you know, if you make a mistake or if you say the wrong thing or if you fail, uh, it's not looked at very well. And then you, you miss out on certain opportunities uh, within that company as a result of that. And if they're comfortable with saying a bad idea, then yeah. that bad idea may lead to a good idea from someone else because you build on top of that. So you can't be afraid to fail. You can't be afraid to voice, make an opinion. Um, you can't uh be afraid to challenge yourself stuff but so step out of your comfort zone and become better awesome are you yeah. seeing some uh some uh as a team is being challenged uh in that you you mentioned um you know building off of those creative processes yeah. and thinking yeah. um are you seeing where others are contributing in ways you never expected yeah yeah and that's growth that's growth and, and that's what we need what is next for outfield um, the next phase of Outfield, we're getting ready to um, release um, a suite of different products. Okay. 
Um, I don't want to necessarily say exactly what they are just yet, uh, but we are uh, expanding our product suite and there should be a number of synergies uh, that take that takes uh, place as a result. Um, and some of the products that we got coming out are pretty, pretty sweet. So I'm really, really excited about how we're getting ready to pierce this market even further um, because this, some of the stuff that we're getting ready to do right now is very disruptive. So, so you're incubating some new products, yeah. working, uh, expanding the team, yeah. um, and, and really taking it to, to the next level. Yeah. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you take uh, the vision uh, from where it's at today to, uh, to where you ultimately want to go? Uh, execution. Execution. Um, focus. Uh, the, the team, a constant reminder to the team uh, where we're going and have them participate in the process so we're all on the same page. And really it's just about knowing the destination, right? If everyone knows the destination, everyone is in, in agreement that this is where we need to go, uh, and this, it all makes sense, then we're going for it. And that's how we reach it. Focus, hard work, uh, and focus. That's awesome. Yeah. Austin, I really appreciate um, everything you've shared today. I uh, learned a lot uh, about you, uh, about Outfield, and about the vision of where uh, the company's going. Uh, shared a ton of uh, information on your story. Um, and, and again, thank you for sharing that. Uh, for those out there at Closers Coffee, thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.